Thank you, Mr. Mena. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Good morning to everybody. I hope uh, uh, benefit uh, to whatever we discuss today. Uh, I will be talking about the safer road infrastructure. So the discussion would first, I would like to emphasize upon that the importance of road safety in our country and then what should be the approach and then what are the main things which you should you should keep it in mind while designing a safe road so as uh, most of you must be aware uh, uh, mr mina sir uh, what is the level of participant generally hello Sir, AE level, sir. A and A double E level. Yes, sir. Achha, okay. So, uh, if any participant has any point to make, uh, he is free to to butt in in between the session, and there is no harm. And at the same time, they should also be prepared with some of their questions and doubts. And if there are any field experiences that they have and they they couldn't find solution they are most welcome to discuss that and if nothing comes from uh, on your own side then maybe i will identify from the list that i have and maybe ask some specific questions so please be prepared okay so when we talk of road transport infrastructure normally there are three major players as you can see it here in this it is the user first of all who actually uses the your uh, sector then he has to have some some rolling stock or some mechanism or some vehicle or even 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 he may have his own foot also to use the road and then road infrastructure itself which will be for the use so there are three basic elements of a road transport system now out of this uh, you should appreciate then we either we build the vehicles or we'll build the roads it is built for the user and user is human that is the main point to be kept in mind so you are not building vehicles but you are building roads so your concern is to uh, related to the roads and for the user that is the human so that means when you are designing or you are when you are building any infrastructure for that matter for for someone for the user whether you are designing a building whether you are designing a road you are designing for someone to use for so you are designing the road for human as you can see it here so if we when we talk of safe uh, road infrastructure at the center of our thinking and center of our planning and designing should be the human. And we should also recognize that the human body is vulnerable. Vulnerable means that he is prone to injuries, etc. etc. So, how do you do the systems approach? Implies that you design safer roads, you have safer vehicles, then of course. The user also has to have some basics to use the road safely and follow certain rules which are for his own good and then to have a safer speed. So speed is very important factor in design of the safe road. Now, if we talk in terms of safety management, then uh, there are two basic approaches for road safety. One is a a, a preventive and the other is reactive so preventive approach means that you take some actions which are uh, before happening of any incidents or accident which is called a proactive approach which is for the prevention of any occurrence of any incident now it is highly unlikely or rather impossible to totally eliminate occurrence of any incident whether it's an accident or any other incident so when it happens, then you do something or you take some action, which is called a reactive approach. So proactive approach implies that you have a, a road safety assessment program. You have a road safety audit. I'm sure most many of you 
uh, must have heard this term road safety audit now it is a lot of uh, concern and and uh, things are being uh, spread in the country all as a whole for road safety audit since this is not a session of road safety audit we will not go much in detail but the basic point with for you to recognize is that most of you are serving pwd officers so you must be aware of the financial audit which uh, the auditor must be coming to your offices and undertaking that audit so similarly if that audit process or or any formal examination is done in terms of road safety then it is called road safety audit then uh, what another point to be kept in mind is normally many of the professionals do not uh, use this term correctly if you do the audit for an exist a new road then it is called a road safety audit but if you do the, that exercise for an existing road then the international practices terminology is that you call it road safety inspection or road safety review just to distinguish between whether it's a new road or it is an existing road then after incident has happened then you have black spot uh, management program and detailed investigation of uh, a particular one particular accident and then you have your network safety management program so these are some of the uh, basic steps for road safety uh, management as a whole and then of course for all these things you have to have a, a policy and and action plan now, of course, uh, about 10 years back, back, the menace of the road safety or rather rather uh, accidents occurrence in the world, they were uh, sort of recognized uh, even at the highest level of the United Nations. And United Nations brought in a sort of a targeted program and declared the decade of 2011 to 2020 as a decade for road safety uh, and the target given was that the uh, road accident should be brought down to 50 percent of course that target has not been met and in india the situation instead of improving has somewhat worsened from the same time while uh, declaring that decade for action for road safety they also suggested uh, how to tackle it and they suggested five pillars for road safety as you can see it in this pillar one is the road safety management then pillar two is the road safety uh, safer roads and mobility that is where you uh, are concerned as a as a engineer safer vehicles for uh, vehicle manufacturers then safer road users uh, as you must have heard in your engineering courses there are three e's for traffic management and safety now those Three E's uh, have been expanded to five E's. Earlier, it used to be uh, safety, uh, engineering, enforcement, and education. Now, two additionals are emergency care and, and evaluation. So, uh, safer road users, and then post crash response. See in the five pillars. So, these are some of the basic pillars on based on which you uh, should have your a safety uh, approach then when we go somewhat in detail we, we find this that for road safety management under pillar you have to have or other advisory is that you have to have a lead agency you have to have a strategy targets and of course funding because unless you have proper fund you will not be able to implement whatever program that you decide for then for safer roads you have improved road safety designs, safety for all categories of users. And then you can also, uh, there's a term called a road assessment program. And there is an NGO and institutions, which is called International Road Assessment Program, IRAP, which uh, normally uh, undertakes the assessment of the road in terms of safety for different categories of users, such as uh, vehicle occupants, occupants and pedestrians, bicyclists, motorcyclists. So they assess the road for the safety for these categories of users. Then safer vehicles. Uh, normally you must have found that majority of roads now uh, vehicles that we have, they have airbags, 
parking sensors. Developed countries, there are sensors all around the vehicle and it can sense if there is any obstruction on the side of the road or in the front, the back, or so and, and take evasive action accordingly. So intelligent vehicles, as we call it. Then safer use road user behavior by way of uh, blood alcohol concentration level laws, seat belt provision, uh, child restraints in developed country. No child is allowed to uh, be traveling in the car unless it is having a proper safe uh, their uh, own child uh, restraint measure and child uh, seat. Then wearing of helmets. Safe road users observing uh, uh, traffic laws, uh, not jumping the red lights, driving in the lane, etc., etc. And then trauma care, as um, some of you must be aware, that if any accident happens, if even if it's a serious accident, and if the medical attention and medical care is given to the victim within one hour of its occurrence, then the chances of his survival are quite bright. And that is what is called the golden hour. Another approach is the change in our thinking also. Normally, traditionally in India, especially, we have been talking of a stage construction that we build a road as a, up to a certain level and then you keep on improving it subsequently. subsequently. So this should not be, this is not a very uh, safe and correct approach. Basically, it should be a long term approach for the time of safety. Uh, and that PWD culture that whatever has been given by the government should be taken as a given thing. Now that should give way to the customer service because user, as, as a user, even if you are a pedestrian, you are a road user, you are paying for it, maybe directly to user fee or indirectly through the taxes. So you are paying for it. When you are paying for anything, for any services, you uh, or normally expect the services based on your investment. That is what is called the customer service. Then, instead of a, a scattered uh, system for uh, making the whole transport system as intelligent, which is called the intelligent transportation system, I'm sure must, some of you must be hearing these terms nowadays. It should be basically an integrated program. So that is how you firstly design the road. Then why you are in operation in a sort of incident response, you have to have a proactive approach. And then fiscal output should give way to your performance based outcome. Fiscal output means that traditionally we have a item rate contract that as a client, as a road authority, we uh, identify and quantify each item of work to be done. And then we ask the contractor or a private player to perform that and then do that. And then uh, he may be responsible for, a, uh, say, a year's time and then he goes away and then it has to be taken care of by the road authority. And instead of that, it should be a performance based outcome. That means the road authority is not concerned about what, how many thickness of the pavement he gives. Uh, what action he does, how high embankment does he make, and etc. And what type of treatment he gives, what of compaction is it? Basically, the client or the road authority is concerned with the performance that the road gives in terms of roughness, in terms of safety, in terms of travel time, etc. Et now, now let us briefly discuss the road safety situation in our country. Now, unfortunately, as you can see in this graph, despite the huge investment that have been made in the country on improvement and development of the road, the fatalities especially, and even of accidents also, that is increasing. So if the fatalities are increasing, that clearly shows that we are not building safe roads. So much so that every year, if we go by the, even by the common figures, we are losing uh, 170 air buses, and you can very well uh, be aware and, and knowing that even a air one crash of air bus creates lot of concerns 
among the people and the government, etc., etc. Whereas we are losing rather, or rather, uh, 170 air buses are getting crashed, uh, if we correlate them with our fatality. Uh, these days, I mean, uh, although it's not a, a very uh, good uh, comparison, but as you can see it here, we are a lot of concern uh, we have for the fatalities due to the COVID-19, but we are killing every year more than that uh, victims of the COVID. So that is how, that is why the road safety is such a crucial issue and it should be for our country. As we go in the number, uh, as we can see, uh, 1,51,000 people are getting killed on our road as per the latest figure of 2018. Ministry of Road Transport and Highways keep on bringing the accident report every year and it is normally available on this so, so some of you who are really interested in this they can give their uh, see that report despite all all the shortcomings which, may, which we may talk about uh, it's in a do document uh, which uh, can be a good reference many researchers have, have shown even the working group on road safety by the government itself has uh, assessed that by if the situation is allowed to, to continue like this, the, uh, the fatalities by the year 2030 could be 260,000. And even the present in, in, in the present time, the World Bank and other institutions are assessing that the figure of 151 is two on lower side. Actually, it may be of the order of 2,000. So that is the seriousness of this. Now, as you can see it here, in the last uh, two three decades, we must have spent about more than 10 lakh crore of uh, uh, investment on developing our road, whereas the fatalities uh, have increased rather uh, almost double. You can see in the year 2000, it was 79,000, and now it is 150. So that means that we are not getting the value for money. Value for money is a term which is now it is quite common in internationally, which basically correlates that the investment made is giving you the return in terms of the uh, monetary or other benefits. Another serious concern should be that there is a current term called accident severity. Accident severity is the persons getting killed per hundred accidents. Now that accident severity used to be 20 uh, in the year 2000 and which has now uh, become or rather increased by one and a half times to 35. That means earlier 20 persons were getting killed in 100 accidents whereas now 35 persons are getting killed in 100 accidents. Obviously whatever we are doing is not safe. Road safety traditionally is considered to be a transportation issue, but we are not treating as a public health issue. So unless we, we seriously think on those terms, uh, the situation is unlikely to get to. In terms of economic also, we are losing about 3% of GDP every year because of the road accidents. Uh, but still, we are not prepared to invest even a fraction of that on road safety. As you must be all aware, uh, as a field officers, that uh, all the time you are told that uh, there is a shortage of funds and we have to manage with it. And the first casualty comes in the way of safety measures like traffic signs and markings. We, sh we do not, uh, we should not uh, forget that whenever any accident happens, despite the loss in terms of mental agony and monetary to the victim, it is lost to the human also, uh, sorry, to the society also, in terms of the vehicle cost and other costs like, like medical expenses, etc. Et so, now if we compare internationally, as you can see in this table, you find that the motorized, uh, motorization in our country is very, very low at uh, these figures are somewhat old in, in some places, but all the same, 
what is available, but it may not have changed a lot in the last two, three years. So in India, the motorization is only 22 per thousand vehicles. Whereas in US, it is 830, or rather New Zealand, it is 60. Whereas the fatality rate per 100,000 vehicles, as you can see it here, in New Zealand, it is 0.1, whereas here we have six. Similarly, fatality rates in terms of the people also, despite our such a large population, in New Zealand, it is six, or in Germany and Japan, it is four, whereas in India, it is 11. And let me one more thing tell you, uh, one more interesting aspect is that the road safety situation in Japan and India, when we gained independence in 1947, is some, somewhat similar. But in the last 70 years, uh, we are nowhere compared to Japan. So that is how uh, our we have to change our thinking and approach towards our building of the road infrastructure. Now, what are the challenges that we have? First of all, lack of commitment. We will we'll keep on talking about road safety and road safety audit, etc., etc. But when it comes to real brass tracks, we don't have well, serious commitment. Ineffective mechanism, wrong concepts, wrong practices. Most importantly, the problem of capacity and capability among the road authorities, consultants, developers, and even the government officer. And based on my whatever limited experience that I have, I find the situation is rather uh, instead of improving, it is going down. Then uh, the emphasis is on Nowadays, the emphasis on building, you see, uh, we, we, we take on, uh, take on taking pride that we are building 40 kilometers road per day, but we are not bothered that those 40 kilometers road that we are building, are they really safe? Are they providing safe travel or not? So that is where the problem is. So political commitment, as you can see it here, I mean, forget about bureaucracy, even professionals also. In 2015, there was a commitment made by our, in our country that by 2020, the reduction will be 50%. Forget about the reduction, it is increased by 2%, by 2018. So, road safety is not on any political party's agenda also. So, to, 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 be, to be somewhat harsh, our society, our society and, and, and nation, they are not paying the attention it deserves to be given to the road. So, theoretically, yes, we have road safety council, we have uh, road safety policy, we also have a committee on road safety. As you can see in this, uh, road safety council was constituted in 2015. It has 105 members. Now, you can very well imagine that if even if 50% of those members are participating in any of the meeting, what sort of decisions can be taken? And incidentally, only one meeting has been held up till now, as you can see it in the last five years. So that shows the commitment and level of seriousness. Now let us see what we can learn from it. There are many countries in the world who have much, much better safety record. We are now have a dubious distinction of the worst safety record in all the countries. Some, some years back, we were somewhat better off than China, but now China has drastically improved. So we have the maximum number of accident fatality around in all the countries. So a strong political commitment at the highest level to promote many countries like, like Japan and US, even the uh, road safety commitment is at the highest level of the governance. Efficient interagency is interdepartmental coordination. There is hardly any coordination. Even in the ministry itself, these are vital type compartments. There has to have a lead agency, like National Highway Transportation Safety Authority Agency in US and uh, SNRA in Sweden and uh, many other countries also in Japan also. So, uh, but in India, as way back in 2006, there was a, a committee constituted which had recommended, of which I, I was also a member, 
which had recommended uh, establishing a uh, independent uh, board for road safety and traffic management. And today we are in 2020, nothing has moved despite number of attempts being made, but the ground reality has not changed. Now in Motor Vehicles Act in 2019, there is some mention of creation of a, a agency, but uh, nothing has, is, is moving, I think, in that direction. So in those, all those countries like Sweden, etc., when they talk of zero vision, et cetera, et cetera, road user is the central focus of planning and design. Whereas in our country, the, the impact group is on motorized transport rather than the vulnerable road. And we tend, while we're designing, we tend to forget that they are also equal partner or equal, uh, equally users of the road. As you can see it here in this slide, uh, world over 1.35 million uh, deaths are occurring on the world. And every 24 seconds, someone is dying on the road. What are the recommendations of the institutions like World Health Organization? Again, somewhat similar to what they said. Identify lead agency, develop a clear vision and mission, assess the problem and policies, then capacity for road traffic injury prevention by way of capacity building, prepare a, a strategy. We are yet to have a proper strategy and action plan for road safety. Allocate financial and human resources. Financial resources, yes, there are to some extent, but human resources is still quite in shortage. Whether they say government, road authorities, whether it's a consultant, whether it's a contractor. Implement specific actions to prevent road traffic crashes. Support development of national capacity and national cooperation. Now, coming back to the brass tacks of signing or developing a safer road. So, first of all, we must start from the planning stage itself. Now, since this is a online course, so I can't ask question directly. So, otherwise, I would have first asked the question and then gone ahead. But anyway, so the road, um, broadly speaking, as two major functions to perform. One is that to take you from your point of origin where you start and the moment you step out of your home, your house, to the place where you want to go, that is called destination. So your starting point is called origin and your point to which you want to go is called destination, that is called the origin and destination. And commonly OD and all that, ODPR, etc., etc. So, if we uh, sort of plot mobility on x-axis and accessibility on uh, y-axis, and if we somewhat closely examine the curve uh, shown here in the slide, fine. Uh, I hope everyone is able to see the movement of the cursor. Is that so? Mina, are you there? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you see the yes, movement of the cursor on the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So as you can see it here, at this point, the, the level of mobility is maximum. And at this point, the level of uh, and, and the accessibility is zero. Now let me first define the accessibility and mobility. So accessibility, as I told you. That the moment you come out of your house and you want to go to a place, then it is your you want to access that place. You want to go to that place. Now, say for example, the place that you want to go is about say 100 kilometers away. So naturally, you would like to be there in a reasonable time frame, depending upon the white at what speed you are traveling. So say for example. Uh, if a, a road has a facility like that, that if it extends of 100 kilometers, you are traveling at a, or you are driving a car at 100 kilometer speed, then you should be able to reach in one hour. So the point of reaching from A to B or O to D is your accessibility issue. 
and reaching in one hour's time while driving at 100 kilometers per hour at 100 meter distance is becomes a mobility issue so mobility is ability to move in a little uh, reasonably uh, reasonable time frame so at this point the level of mobility is highest whereas the accessibility is zero that means there is no access provided on on this so this is called your highest category of road that is your expressway which in us is called so this is the level now here at this point as you can see it here the accessibility is at the highest level but mobility is zero that means no through traffic and it is called cul de sac sac means your access street your colony street as you must have seen and then of course in in between you have uh, some level of mobility and accessibility major arterial or a national or state highway and then as the accessibility increases and mobility decreases you have uh, minor arterial or mdrs then you have uh, still less mobility and more accessibility so you can have a ruler road or something like that so that is how this is called your hierarchical system of road planning now hierarchical system of road planning has one more advantage as you have your hierarchy in your office work uh, now majority of you are at the level of uh, assistant engineer am i right mr abhishek mukherjee mr abhishek mukherjee Let me see. Mr. Mahendra Singh, is he there? No. Mr. Bina. Mr. Niranjan Bhar, is he there? No. Mr. Naveen Lal Verma, is he there? Hello. Hello. Hello, Mr. Naveen Lal. Sir. Yes, sir. Is he there? I request participants to kindly yeah. respond. Hello, Mr. Navin Lal Verma. Are they physically there or they are just doing their own things? Huh? Mina? Sir, it's difficult to confirm. Hello, Mr. Navin Lal Verma. that is why that is why i say that you to make sure that all participants are have their video on mr so abhishek I, mukherjee are you there acha junaid aziz is there yes sir yes sir mr aziz you are from where yes sir yes sir i am here yes sir abhishek mukherjee yeah i can see you you are yes, from abhishek mukherjee is there You are from which state, sir? Jammu Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, Achha. sir. Acha, okay. At what level? Yes, sir. At A, sir. You are a civil engineer, eh? Sir, PMG S Y. It's okay. You are you are holding the position of assistant engineer, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, do you directly report to chief engineer? <laughs> Huh? Yes, sir. Sir, we have had it. We have had it. We have had it. Huh? Sir, we have had it. Sir. Ah, that's so. That what I want to tell you all is that if you are at the level of assistant engineer, you report to executive engineer. Executive engineer report to superintending SC. engineer, and then superintending engineer reports to executive. Uh, chief engineer yes assistant chief engineer level officer will not directly report to chief engineer so that is called yes, the hierarchy similarly yes, right, similarly in road hierarchy a national highway or a state highway should not directly meet a ruler road it should meet either the next higher category road or the next lower category road so mdr 
should be meeting either a national state highways or MDR, not the other way around. So that is called the hierarchical system of road planning. Yes. Now, is it a theoretical concept or is it practically possible? Who will answer this question? Mr. Atantu, Atanu Das, hello. Hello. Mina. Yes, sir. Mr. Atanu Das. No, is there any problem any in part? your uh, system? No, sir. Then why people are not responding? Are they physically there any or they are just? Huh? Any participant, please respond. Hello. I think there is no point of my continuing if people are not there. Mr. Mina. Sir. I think I think we can take a, a sort of a, a, a break from what I am talking about and first make sure that how many people are physically present. Mr. Sanjay. Hello. Hello. Yes. yes, sir. Mr. Sanjay, I can see his face. Mr. Sanjay. Yes, sir. Now. <clears throat> I think you 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 heard what I said right now uh, about the hierarchical system of road planning. Is it so? Yes, sir. So is it a theoretical concept or it can be implemented? Sir, it is more or less a theoretical concept, not practically applicable, right? Not practically possible, eh? Yes, sir. Achha, that is not why in practice, that, sir. Eh? I am not saying that for not possible. I am saying that it is not in our habit right now that we are using hierarchical concept. It is more Achha, or less okay. theoretical. Achha, I am glad that you have modified your statement rather than saying Thank that you. it is purely theoretical, not possible. You have modified it. So, why I ask this question is, unfortunately, majority of us they feel that there is a big difference between theory and practice. And that is why we have all such type of wrong roads or unsafe roads that we have. In developed countries, with all those countries which have much better safety records, they, they have this first theory that whatever is theoretical, it is actually, that is how it should be practiced. So, I will, that is why I believe in showing you the photograph for the purpose of illustration, as you can see in this photograph, this photograph has been taken from the aeroplane. And as you can clearly see in this photograph, you have this major arterial. I am sure when all of you are able to see the, the movement of the cursor. This is your major arterial, which could be, in, if it's an urban situation, it will be arterial, or if it's a rural situation, it can be an expressway type thing. Then you have a distributor. So as you can see it here, distributor is meeting the arterial. Then you have local history, and then you have access street, as you can see it here. So access street is not directly meeting the. So that is what I want to impress upon. That is when we talk of the hierarchical system of road network planning, it is actually possible. In a, even in our system also, is supposing your ruler road is to be first of all even the guidelines given by the NRDA and PMGSY does not say that ruler road should take off or meet the national highway. If you go through their document, uh, there is a, a, a figure or a sketch given which shows the ruler road taking off from an MDR. So even if for some reason if you have a ruler road which is directly meeting, they, they, it can still be converted into hierarchical network planning 
by connecting all such categories of roads into one service road and then taken to a major intersecting point and then allowed to meet the high very high category so that is the uh, that is how we start now other important aspect of the design is the speed now so there are two things of speed one is the speed at which you design the facility or category of road so that will depend if supposing it's initial highway the design speed in our country is 100 kilometers per hour if it's the other category of road it varies from 80 to 60 so this is one thing the other thing is that they allow the maximum speed that is allowed to the, uh, to the traveler or the vehicle owner to drive at that is called the speed limit so the importance of the two is that uh, design speed in terms of uh, uh, the geometrics that you have for that particular road and design speed in terms of operation. So it is a well established fact that if a person is getting hit by a vehicle at a 30 kilometers per hour speed, then his chances of survival are quite, quite bright. But if he is hit by a speed of 50 kilometers per hour uh, vehicle, then his chances of survival are quite bleak and he may get killed. So that is the importance of the speed. As you can see it here, 20 MPH, that means 30 kilometers, nine pedestrians out of 10 will survive. But if it is 40, only one may survive. So that's the importance of the speed. So that is what is to be kept in mind. Another important point is that there are four types, one, one should know, and it can be of some use, that there are four types of speeds. One is the statutory speed by uh, uh, decided by the uh, government or authority. Whatever. Then is the posted or the maximum speed that you have. Then there are some special uh, speeds for school zone and work zone, and then the variable or advisory speed as you can have variable speed many developed countries have the type of variable uh, speed limit signs posted on the roads normally the, the road facility is designed uh, this, this is not a it's a broad uh, of time to go into the detail so normally the speed is designed uh, for at the uh, 95 to 98 percentile of the speed, spot speed that you measure for a particular road or a particular. But when you are deciding upon the allowable speed or maximum speed, then it is 85th percentile. So broadly speaking, the allowable speed or speed limit should always be less than 8 to 12 miles per hour uh, from the design speed which has been found by the experiments and research done in USA. So that is again one thing is to be kept in mind. Unfortunately, the notification by the ministry is also really faulty, I should say. Whereas in for expressway, the design speed is 120 kilometers per hour, as well as maximum speed allowed is also 120 kilometers per hour, which is highly unsafe. So what what is the approach that we should have for safer highways first and foremost out of the three components of road transport system between drivers uh, vehicles and roads drivers or users are human so human are bound to commit mistakes and make errors so it has to it is the road infrastructure which has to cope up with the human shortcomings in it. since you are all genius responsible for building of roads so that is why you are concerned about the road infrastructure if you are designing a, a vehicle then you could have been told something different so humans are bound to commit mistakes it is road infrastructure which has to cope up uh, the shortcomings and failings of the human and that is why you see that is the difference in all those developed countries which have much better safety record they had recognized this 
this point and aspect as far back as history. And that is how they brought in a concept of building forgiving highway. That means if a human or if a user is committing a mistake, he should be forgiven. Now, how do you build a forgiving highway? We'll see it somewhat later. So, responsibility is to be shared in designer and user. So, planning and designing forgiving highways, preventing pedestrians and another other vulnerable users from accessing the highways, and that is why normally you find that on expressways pedestrians are not allowed. Preventing motor vehicles from entering pedestrian zone. In most of the European cities, the main center of the city has now been converted into the pedestrian zone only, where only either emergency vehicles are allowed or public transport. No private motor vehicles are allowed in those areas. Now in Delhi or uh, uh, also in India also, we have some very in a very limited manner, but in developed countries, that's very common. Systems planning with vision. Prevention through safety audit as we recognize in the very first or second slide and the reduction to safety. So common mistakes normally we do, which should be avoided. First of all, don't try to design cheap road. Try to design safe road. All good things in life cost money. And I do not know why we have uh, made ourselves incapable of thinking big. So don't, of course, all the countries in the world, they are equally conscious of the cost factor. But if they are designing a, an expressway, or if you're designing a, even a national highway ruler road, they will not compromise on the minimum features which are be provided. Say for example, on ruler roads, I, I hope many of you are from ruler roads. Now the takeoff point, that is the intersection point, is hardly given any attention in terms of its design or provision of the proper markings or so, or, or, uh, traffic sign. So that is why, and you are doing, or even if they are signs, they are totally wrong signs. Avoid stage construction for the last 70 years, and of course, not now. Still, we are, many of us think in terms of stage construction. Now, stage construction is a very dicey issue. So, we should think in terms of uh, developing a road, in, road infrastructure is not built for five years. It is built for 50 to 100 years. So, you may not design it for 100 years or whatever it is, but at least design it for 50 to 100 years. Design and provide for all prospective users, if supposing uh, you have uh, bus traffic, or supposing you have a local traffic, then you must provide. If you don't provide, then what happens? Same road space, it will be used for all categories of users. And we'll talk how dangerous it could be in the future. Plan and provide for life cycle costing rather than in a piecemeal approach. Provide correct and informed traffic signs. Majority or rather most of traffic signs in our roads are wrong. Intersections not giving attention, no surprises for users, and absence of nighttime delineation. These are some of the very common mistakes that we have in our roads. So, yes, we have already discussed that. Now coming back to the real brass tracks. As you can see it here, road, road have <coughs> three damage, rather I should say four damage. One is the linear dimension, that is the length of the road. The other is the lateral dimension, that is the width or, or, or shoulders, etc. Then third is the uh, vertical dimension, that means the thickness of the pavement and space and subways, etc. I will add another dimension, that is the time. You build a road, not for five years, but at least for 30, 50 years. So that is four dimension. So <clears throat> if we talk of the, <clears throat> some of the basic terminology or terms of the road, first of all, the carriageway, it could be a single lane road, or it could be a, a double lane road, or it will be a two carriage road divided 
IA median. So all all this all this form the part of the carriage wave. Then you have shoulders and carriage wave plus shoulders. You may have a width which is called the roadway. Then you have two imaginary lines. One is the building line and the other is control. So <clears throat> the building line is the imaginary line on uh, uh, beyond and and that that is the a limit uh, at which the buildings can be allowed to. Now, control line is another uh, imaginary line. Many states have that also, uh, within which the activities <coughs> or what you call the land use is to be controlled. <laughs> Say, for example, you will not allow any facility which may attract or generate a lot of traffic with the existing road or the planned road is incapable of taking care of unless proper arrangements are made for it. So that is what the function of the control line has. So <clears throat> how you make the for, uh, uh, build, uh, forgiving highway? Wider shoulders, flatter slide slopes. Normally we provide side slopes of 2 x to 1. So if we make the side slopes of more than 2 x to 1, rather 4 x to 1, it becomes much uh, uh, less damaging to the any errant vehicle uh, going on to that. Provision of safety barriers, especially on hilly terrain, uh, so that uh, no vehicle is allowed to drop down the valley side. Take care of driver's behavior and errors by provision of the signs and markings, delineations, Right time driving, paving of shoulder, fluent alignment and profile, improved side distance, and removal or add a delineation of roadside hazards. As you can see, the photograph here, sorry. Now, this is a <clears throat> such a large trunk just on the side of the carriage, hardly any distance. Into it. So, you can very well imagine. The hazard it will pose, especially for the night driving. Reduce conflict points, especially at intersection. We'll discuss a little more detail about intersections uh, subsequently. Control on access, dividing in the two direction of travel by provision of median. Then, whenever the major road, like your national highway or state highway, is passing through linear settlement, then the provision for separating the slow moving uh, vulnerable users from the uh, fast moving traffic and uh, depending upon the category of road or situation, providing safe crossing facilities. Then for long distance traveler, <clears throat> some measures to uh, break the driver fatigue or monotony by provision of rest areas or lay, lay, lay <clears throat> Then facilities for pedestrians by way of footwalks, Railing, tight subways, zebra crossing, etc., etc. Now, if you want to give importance to the pedestrians, then we have to keep it in mind. The depending upon the uh, category of road, what type of facilities for pedestrians we should plan and provide for. So, if supposing it's an expressway, then of course no pedestrians. If it's an arterial road, you have your national highway, pedestrians can be allowed, but only at a formal crossing point, which will be identified uh, and which should be, by identifying, it should be most preferred crossing location. One should always keep it in mind that pedestrians is like, are like water. And normally it has been found that pedestrians do not want or like walk for more than 500 to 1 km. So that means if you're planning any such facility, they must have some facility for the crossing at every uh, 500 meters preference. And the formal crossing, it could be at grade or grade separated depending upon the uh, pedestrian movement and the vehicle volume. That is called the, normally many of you must have heard the terminology PV squares <clears throat> more than 10 to the power 8. Now, of course, that concept is also under 
question, but uh, for the time being, we get a little bit. Then, if it's a local load and access road, then it could be a sort of a shared space concept. <clears throat> and they, uh, in developed countries, uh, access road, especially which are passing through the residential areas, the people living and, and children playing have preference. And a country like Holland, and which has been adopted in many other countries, but with the, what they call is the Wunover. That means this is my backyard. So I have the priority rather than the movement of the vehicles. And how, how can we do that? There's another terminology or technique which is called the traffic calming. And one more thing which you should keep in mind as a good professional is traffic calming terminology is used only for residential streets, not for your national highways or expressways or high category. Normally, many of the professionals keep on using the terminology, but you should uh, keep this thing very much in mind. Then the ultimate is that you provide the whole street only for pedestrians. As I told you earlier, most of the European city centers have pedestrians only streets where the vehicles are not allowed. So these are <clears throat> uh, uh, some of the approaches by which you can have uh, provide safe road infrastructure. Then pedestrian facilities, as you can see it here, safe practices to provide a proper continuous facility. As you can see, it, uh, the normal practice in India is that, as you can see in these photographs here, there's hardly any, any even, even for the semblance sake, any sidewalk provision or anything like that. They are left to men for themselves here. Theoretically, yes, there is something, but then as you can see it here, there is a sudden break, there is a drain. So if you have to use the sidewalk, either you drive, uh, you swim through the drain, or you come onto the main road. So, in, in again, in developed countries, if, if a road is urban road, especially, if urban road is passing through a, a shopping street, then they provide some extra width for window shoppers. So that is how the attention is given for the need of the pedestrian. Then whenever the crossing is to take place, there's a drop in a ramp provided at the crossing point. And then if there's any physically impaired person to use the sidewalk, then tactiles are provided, as you can see it here. And then these are continuous tactiles taken up to this. Then of course, pedestrian. Now, in, in, in pedestrian facilities also, it has to be a systems approach. Systems approach means provision for pedestrians to walk along the road and then pedestrians to cross the road. And mind you, the, the sidewalks should be continuous and usable from O and D, what you call origin destination. And they should be guided, rather, I should say, forced to cross only at the uh, identified crossing point to the provision of pedestrian side uh, guard rail so that they are not able to cross the road at any point they want to and taking the shortest path. So, this is called the systems approach. So normally in rural roads, we do not have, uh, as you can see, it has any, any, any space uh, or uh, facility for pedestrians to walk. As you can, this is the rural situation and this is the urban situation. There's hardly any crossing facility. Again, same thing, sidewalks, even if they are there, they are totally enclosed. So, what are the basic design elements? <clears throat> Median, if it's a wide road and, and uh, the, it is always better high category roads to provide a separating uh, separator between the two direction of travel, which is generally called median. Then <clears throat> you have a curve to distinguish or differentiate between the travel path and the uh, place for pedestrians to walk. Normally, these should be semi-mountable or mountable curves. But in India, 
I do not know. I mean, I am unable to figure out why. Mostly these uh, curves which are provided for pedestrian sidewalk, they are almost up to one feet. So that means if um, someone has to use these footpaths and then uh, keep on walking for some di some distance, he has to do the hop, stop, jump race, like uh, jumping and, and crossing and then things like that, which is highly undesirable and unsafe thing and inconvenient, highly inconvenient. And that is why normally we uh, have a developed a practice that even if there is a sidewalk, we normally walk on the main carriageway. Then in many of the European and developed countries, they in residential area especially, they have a speed zoning, 30 miles zone or 20 mile zone. That means in those areas, no vehicle is allowed to drive for more than 20 kilometer or 30 kilometers. And then of course, as you can see in this, pedestrian streets, totally pedestrian, no element. So these are some of the basic mm, design elements for the safety, for especially for the pedestrians or human or users. This is another uh, typical uh, street safe, safe systems approach. Now for rural roads, first and foremost, besides other things is well designed intersections. If there is a considerable, rural roads have a considerable traffic of the pedestrians and cyclists. So, of course, paved shoulder may not be always possible. Then it should be still be well maintained shoulders, well stabilized shoulders, so that they are convenient for pedestrians to walk. Otherwise, they will be using the same road space, which could be highly dangerous, especially in night time. Passing places, if the road is passing through the hill road, crash barriers and sharp cuts on hills, proper design and location of bus bays, if the buses are to move on the rural roads, there could be a possibility. <clears throat> then uh, normally speed humps or rumble strip treatment should be not provided. I would, I would strongly not recommend that. I would uh, recommend visual uh, measures for speed reduction. But if at all, if speed humps or rumble strips are provided, they should be well designed. <clears throat> so, if there is a cattle crossing, provision should be made to standard uniform traffic sign, hazard markers, and delineations. So, well designed intersection layout, bus stops, and laybys, facilities for pedestrians, traffic signs, pavement. These are some of the very, very Basic elements for a safe road. Pavement marking, controlling the speed through visual measures, delineators, safety fences, lighting, service roads. If it's a very high volume road and then the, uh, the uh, uh, local traffic has to be segregated, then it must have service roads. Otherwise, what will happen? The local traffic, which is normally slow moving traffic, would use the same space as the high speed traffic and that will lead to the uh, occurrence of conflicts and accidents. As use of this walk uh, frontage zone for window shoppers, then pedestrian, then tree plantation, then if at all you want to provide for parking, you can provide in a commercial area. Now, Some mix up. Oh. Okay. Uh, I'll take some time because uh, some, I think, two slides have uh, got missed, missed, missed. So just wait for a while.
anyway so i don't know uh, where did i miss that are ye kya ho gaya sir dobara slide share kar dijiye sir acha ruko 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 i no no actually the two slides which she got deleted which i want to bring about Just give me two three minutes, okay? Sir, we, yeah, sir, we may we may continue after ten minutes break, sir. Actually, ah, that's all. Okay, okay. Ah, that's better. Take yes, a break. Yeah. Okay. So it is eleven eight. Yes, sir. So we come back at eleven uh, twenty, eh? Yes, sir. Okay. Meanwhile, I will I will just correct this, eh? Yeah. Okay. We will resume the sessions uh, after ten minutes break at eleven twenty. meanwhile mena sir you please make sure that all participants are physically present yes sir okay And the important measure for the safety which needs to be provided on road is the crash barrier, especially for roads in the hills. Now, and and that too on valley side of the, wherever the road is built. So there are three types of crash barrier: rigid, semi-rigid, and flexible. So rigid. No deflection when it's stuck, as we have uh, New Jersey barrier. You must, many of you must be seen, as you can see it in this uh, photograph here. And this is the dimensions. 
about uh, 80 to uh, 100 uh, centimeter. Then <clears throat> semi-rigid uh, barrier, which uh, allows a small deflection and then recoil back. Now that is the, <clears throat> the there are two types. One is the normal W profile. The other is tri beam. Tri beam is somewhat at a higher uh, height or height compared to the W profile by about 10 centimeters. And uh, for high speed roads, it will be better to use like expressway provided tri beam there. And the third one is the flexible one where uh, the wire rope fencing like where the <clears throat> When a vehicle is struck against this, it uh, uh, flexes a lot and then recoils back. So these are the three types of barriers which are can be used, and as when one can uh, rightly guess, the New Jersey or rigid barrier is the uh, least expensive, and wire rope is the more expensive. Uh, another, you can see it here that in the median uh, central portion where there is a restriction uh, of land uh, in hills or even in plain, uh, we, should, we can have the, the New Jersey barrier. And especially in work zone, we need to demarcate. Most of the developed country now are using these New Jersey barriers to de demarcate the work zone. Whereas in India, we are still uh, grouping with the old, uh, unsafe, highly dangerous practice of putting sandbags filled with uh, painted white just for the sake, which, which could be okay for the daytime, but at night time they are highly dangerous. Then we have uh, cash barriers here, uh, semi-rigid types, and these are wire rope fences. The more important part besides these is the provision of the <clears throat> uh, reflectors for the night driving and the entry. And whenever the crash barriers are meeting with the concrete uh, structures of the culverts of the bridges, they should be properly embedded. These are some of the important points to be kept in mind while providing the uh, crash barriers. <clears throat> and a very, very important point, which is commonly um, done in a very wrong way, even the uh, standard is wrong, that uh, IRC 119, is that the face of this uh, metal beam crash barrier is at a, some setback of 10 centimeter from the face of the curve. Now, if you are providing a barrier curve of uh, height of more than 250 millimeter, you can very well imagine that the vehicle will first strike against this barrier and then goes on recoiling or unpredictable trajectory or whatever it is, and whatever damage is to be done is to be done. And this, there, there, there will be no occasion for it to, <coughs> uh, this uh, metal beam crash barrier to come into role with it. So this is highly, <coughs> more technically correct approaches that these two vertical should be in the same, like this, unless this is a, a mountable curve. So if it's a barrier curve, should be in same vertical element. This is a common mistake normally we do, many of the professionals do. I mean, uh, what can I say? I mean, the IRC 119 is wrong that way. As you can see it here. <clears throat> now, provision of trash barriers like this is just a waste of money. It serves no purpose at all. As you can see it here, this barrier curve and the crash barrier has been provided at a, almost one feet away back from the crashing barrier. Here it is about six inches to nine inches. Sir, your slides are not showing. Sir, your desktop ka view is showing. Why you are telling me so late? Sir, I thought, sir, you are going to open it. We are going to open it. Oh, so when will you see it? Now it's okay. Yes, sir. Huh? Now it's okay, sir. Oh, so that means you could not see these ones. This was, this was seen. No, 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 sir. I was thinking. Oh, so, okay, okay, sorry. So I'll start from again. So crash barrier, of course, you must have heard what I, whatever I said up till now. As you can see it here, this is your rigid barrier, the New Jersey barrier. This is your W profile or tri-beam barrier. This is your wire rope. 
and this is the provision you can provide on median you can provide on for demarcation of the work zone which is common practice in most of the developed countries even in south africa also it's quite common then you have uh, these uh, metal beam barrier or tri beam and then these are wire wire rope fences and an important point which i told you was providing the end treatment uh, at the end of it and provision of the uh, reflectors as you can see this is the end treatment in new jersey barrier this is the end treatment of the wire rope fencing this is the end treatment for a metal beam crash barrier and this is the treatment given where the metal beam crash crash barrier is meeting with the concrete barrier of the culverter bridges this is what i was telling about the placement now it should always be placed at the <coughs> same vertical alignment as the, the that of the trunk which is the common mistake that we as you can see in this photograph these are from the express ways recently completed this is another very common mistake that if this is your width of the median then you are providing in the middle of it again same thing vehicle will and, and these are barrier curves mind you so vehicle will strike against that and then recoil back or whatever is going to happen so in a, in a in a very cynical manner one can say that the designer is saving the expensive part of the road infrastructure at the cost of few lives now <clears throat> important component of safe design is the intersection now as you can see it here intersection also have hierarchy so at the some some uh, one is the lowest category and then at the highest category so the lowest category is the priority intersection priority intersection means that if a side road is meeting a main road or a higher category road then the uh, the vehicle uh, on the higher category roads has the priority over the vehicle on the low category so the vehicle on the high low category road will sort of temporarily stop give way to vehicle on the high category road find a safe gap and then only enter on the higher category now in in us all the side road or 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 an all all, all intersection is irrespective of the of provision they have to stop before they enter to the to the intersection but in uk there is a practice of give way where the side road has to give way to the main road then this is quite okay if the traffic on the main road as well as on the side road is quite low but as the volume of traffic or number of vehicles keep on increasing then you have a roundabout where all the vehicles have equal priority or rotary there are there is a fine distinction between roundabout and rotary and then uh, when uh, if the vehicle is if the road uh, volume is still increasing then roundabout cannot meet the requirement then you have a signal so either roundabout is dismantled or even the roundabout is provided with a signal if the signal timings are becoming such that uh, one phase has more than 120 seconds waiting phase then that means that that signal is uh, that uh, intersection is getting meeting the full capacity then you go in for the great separated interchanges so that is the hierarchy of the intersections as you can see it here at the intersection are the the areas of conflict conflict means collision in the two categories of movement it could be vehicle to vehicle it could be vehicle to non motorized traffic it could be vehicle to the pedestrians so first is right angle collision then back to back now in india rear end collision are found to be quite common cause of accident then side sweeps and then cross as you can see it here for a this is your give way intersection where your the side road has to give way to the main road now as you can see it for four arm intersection there are 32 conflict points 
so the design of intersection basically is aimed to reduce the number of conflict points so highest category is a multi level interchange we'll see what later where absolutely there is no chance of any conflict between the two extremes of so priority intersection roundabout signalize and grade separator now we'll first let us talk about the uh, at grade separator so the priority intersection and roundabout signalize are at grade intersection and when you go in for the suppression of the grade then it becomes a grade separated interchange then it has also have a different uh, number of configuration the diamond interchange then elevated rotary the clover leaf, the wind trumpet, then multi level. We'll see somewhat later <clears throat> what are these ones. So, the at grade intersection, but so there are certain some of the basics which are to be kept in mind. Of course, the detailed designs, uh, design of intersection is uh, somewhat. Uh, complicated uh, exercise and one has to unless you do it yourself you will not be able to do it so after uh, this session i will tell you uh, uh, key key as normally you must have in lower classes you must have uh, heard uh, that there used to be a key a small book sort of a ready reckoner i will tell you the key in the uh, session so <clears throat> there are some of the basic design considerations are it should be on flat ground, not on the gradient, not at all, absolutely. Even if the intersecting road is gradient, at the intersection point or an intersection area, they should be brought to the same level or the flat ground. Then the crossing road should preferably be meeting the, uh, the other road at 90 degrees. Or, or 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 intersecting at right angle that is always safer because the uh, the path is the shortest which the uh, both the roads take <clears throat> intersections are normally designed for peak hour traffic then medium ra radius 18 meter in rural areas and 9 to 15 meters in urban areas it will depend upon the turning radius for the uh, categories of vehicle which are expected to be used but these are some of the basic guidelines which can be kept in mind of course i would strongly suggest that if you want to really interested and go in for that detailed exercise then ircsp 41 gives the detailed guidelines so <clears throat> visibility is another important as you can see in this photograph is the problem of visibility one this car cannot see any any vehicle or anyone coming from this direction so availability of visibility provision of the channelizing island as you can see to guide the movement of the vehicle in different stream well designed this is very important because intersections are the areas where you while driving itself you have to make a decision if you are in, you see another important very very important point which has to be kept in mind while designing a road is to always keep it in mind that how a first time user would be able to negotiate the road, especially during night time. Because first time user not conversant or aware of the topography or the layout of the road. Secondly, in the night time, the visibility is an issue. If it is not properly delineated or marked, so always while designing a road, is a designer should always keep it in mind how a first time user in night time would be able to. So, <clears throat> channelizing islands, lighting, especially in the night times, if it's a complicated intersection or urban areas, well designed signs and marking, these are basic tools for guiding the uh, users to either go straight or take turn or slow down or whatever. If there is a significant movement of pedestrians or cyclists, then provision for their crossing. Free traffic flow and, of course, safety. 
fraction of the x. Then, uh, when we talk of roundabout, uh, we should be a uh, good professional, be able to distinguish between the roundabout and rotary. The fine difference, but yes, one should know it. Although, uh, in practice, uh, normally we mix up the terminology. So, roundabout is on a concept of give way. So, the intersecting arm will give way to the traffic which is already on the roundabout and allow it to move and go around and then be in turn. So, it's working on the concept of the give way and normally roundabout are smaller in, uh, in size and in the, the central island is smaller. Rotary, on the other hand, works on a principle of weaving in and weaving out. <clears throat> and that is why in rotary, as you can see it in this year, the length allowing the weaving has is very significant and important. So it has to have a, a proper weaving length so that the traffic from different arms are able to, as you can see it here, they come from different directions, merge, travel for some distance, and then weave out. So weave in and weave out. So these are the principles for the rotary, which are basically large in dimension, weaving length also, round about a small length. These are the final points that one should keep. In Indian situation, normally, uh, just to be uh, telling you, we, even if we may call it a roundabout, uh, practically speaking, it may not be working on the principle because we have, we don't have that traffic discipline. So in a country like UK or US, where the traffic discipline is of very high order, yes, it works. And normally they have roundabouts, mini round, they have even mini roundabouts, double roundabouts, but in India, Normally, even if we call it a roundabout and the central island is not very large, but basically it is a working on the principle of rotary. <laughs> now, as you can see it here, this is a <clears throat> typical uh, depiction of provision of uh, markings and signs on a, as you can see it here, it's a priority intersection. Uh, uh, for a ruler road. As you can see, this is the main uh, highway road or high category road, and this is your low category or ruler road. So, on the approach to the intersection on the ruler road, first of all, you have to have a direction sign and then a, a cautionary sign that the major road ahead. Then, uh, PMGSY mandates provision of a, a, a sign showing the, the symbol and then some details about the road, etc., etc. So that can be placed at this location. Then uh, at the crossing, uh, if it's a give way marking, then you should have a give way sign here. If it's a stop marking, then you have a stop. I think stop may be safer better to ask for vehicle to stop. Then on the main road, on this side, you have uh, again a cautionary sign and then direction sign. Here you can have a destination sign also. More importantly, at this location, you have sign for sharp deviations, which is very helpful during night time, and then direction sign for left and right. From in this direction, again, same thing. So this is, even if this basic, and then of course, a safe turning radius at the uh, meeting point. So even if not much is done and these signs are provided, they go a long way in providing a safe travel on the road. These are the sign configuration uh, normally on, on, a, on a roundabout or on a four arm intersection, as you can see it here, direction sign is very important roundabout again direction sign and, and cautionary sign and, and and keep on left sign so these are some of the basic signs which are already
given in IRC 35, which you can refer. Again, little more detail. This is taken from the Australian practice, as you can see it here. First of all, a sign, <coughs> a graphic sign for a roundabout, then cautionary sign for a roundabout, then a direction sign for this particular uh, destination. So, uh, and then sharp deviation sign at the roundabout, as you can see it here. Similarly, for other arms also. And then provided with the markings. We'll see in detail uh, the uh, more details about the markings. As you can see it here, some of the detailed markings. This is this is taken from uh, uh, U.S. practice, as you can see it here, the direction of travel is in the opposite direction, but you can very well uh, conceptualize it uh, from your... Uh, incidentally, let me tell you, many of you may not be aware, as I have learned while interacting with people like you. In India, we have a right hand drive, whereas in most of the uh, European and in U.S., it's a left hand drive. So we have a right hand drive and we drive on the left because we in the car we sit on the right. So when you have a uh, right hand drive, the most problematic or uh, risky turning is the right turning. So whenever we are designing intersection, we are trying to eliminate the conflict during the right turning. That's the basic principle. Even when we are designing the great separated interchange, we are con converting all the right turnings into the left turning first. So, so these are the extent of pavement marking which should be there on your four arm intersection. As you can see it here, the island, channelizing island, uh, the, uh, the dimensions are such that there is a space for provision of the marking. So that the vehicles are pre-warned before it can actually strike against the physical obstruction in the path. That's the intention of these type of shapes and marks. Now, for hill roads, the most common position is the what you call the hairpin beds. Normally, here, I mean, I have found personally that in developed countries like US, there are very, very few hairpin bends, especially on the major roads. But in Indian situation, we are yet to come out of that mindset to eliminate the hairpin bends on our major roads on hills. So anyway, coming back to the Indian situation, if you have a hairpin bend, the least that can be done is to provide proper signs and markings. As you can see it here, this is what I have tried to uh, uh, sort of a, give a guidance. That first of all, you provide a sign for sharp turn, then you provide a sign for sharp curve, chevron sign, then at the apex of the curvature, you provide sign for sharp deviations. <coughs> And then compulsorily, these crash barriers. Similarly, from the other direction of travel, it's quite likely that on the this side of this, or rather beyond the uh, apex of the hairpin bend curvature, there could be a valley side. So you provide a crash barrier. Now for the center also, you should provide a marking system which is given in IRC S55, which provides for no, no crossing zone like that. So these are some of the measures which can be very well taken on providing safety on the air. Now, 
now coming to the great separated interchange case these are normally provided on a high volume high speed high category roads such as expressway or sometimes at national highway now when we talk uh, of the expressways then we have the two types of uh, great separated interchanges one is the service interchange and the other is the systems interchange systems interchange is the interchange with another another expressway or high category road which could be or which should be uh, in form of either a clover leaf or a multi level interchange the service interchange is the provided at interchange with somewhat less important roads if example a, if it's a mdr or other side road then you should have service interchange and then diamond or trumpet are the most should be the most preferred ones the spacing of interchange desirably should be more <clears throat> uh of the order of 20 30 kilometers but minimum should not be less than 3 kilometers in any case to allow, allow for the weaving as i have told you uh, what is the weaving and deceleration and acceleration deceleration is that when you are reducing from a high speed to low speed so you reduce if you are taking off from the main road to a side road then you should have a deceleration lane to allow you to slow down and when you are coming on from the side road to the main road, then you have acceleration lane to allow you to speed or increase your traffic uh, speed. So these are some of the basic uh, shapes. This is the diamond and the shape. I will discuss in detail. Uh, this is your trumpet. This is your clover leaf, and this is your uh, multi-level. This is a double trumpet. So th these are some of the basic shapes of your great separated interchanges. Now let us see how a diamond interchange works. Now this is your main highway, say expressway, and this is your side. I hope everyone is able to see the movement of the cursor. Mina, hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, this is your diamond interchange <clears throat> where this is the main road and this is your side road. And the vehicle from the main road would decelerate and come onto the ramp <coughs> towards the side road. Now, at this point, there will be either a signal or a give way so they will this vehicle will either stop or give way find a gap and then only take a right turn so the right turnings are allowed so as you can see it here normally the right turning would have taken place on the main highway but that right turnings have been taken off from the main highway and allowed on the side road where the traffic is low and the speeds are also low and you can uh, tolerate a slowing down or stoppage of the vehicle. So this is diamond interchange. Another important point to kept in mind is which whereas I do not know why most of our professionals are not adopting that. Expressways normally world over are built on a on, on the level ground and the side roads are taken on the elevated one. It has distinct advantage particularly from environmental point of view, it causes less pollution, especially for the noise pollution on the abutting properties. And secondly, it is less expensive. As you can see it here, if you build a bridge, this is if supposing this is a three lane or rather six lane highway. So that means you are building a bridge of eight lane highway, obviously, because you build a bridge for a longer uh, design period. Whereas in this case, you are built, of course, the length may be little more, but you are building a bridge only for two lane highway. Another important point is 
that you are wanting to reduce the speed from high to low. So if it is on an up gradient, then it is easier and somewhat automatic that the speed of the vehicle gets reduced because you are climbing. And in, if you want to reduce the speed, then since you are descending, it is easier for the vehicle to increase the speed. So these are some of the advantages of taking the side road at a, a bridge location. So this is this was the principle, and this is how a, uh, as you can see it here, it is like this. This vehicle coming on to the uh, elevated portion and then taking turn the left or right. This is your diameter change. Then this is uh, and then improved. Uh, system for diamond interchange is a dumbbell interchange, which is a typically British practice. Now, in diamond interchange, at this point, you can see uh, there has to be temporary stoppage of the vehicle for taking turns. In dumbbell interchange, by provision of a roundabout, there is no need for anyone to use. Uh, temporarily stop, etc. It can take and uh, uh, take a turn and then depending upon take it uh, right turn coming up from here. So this is basically a dumbbell interchange where the roundabouts instead of a uh, perpendicular crossing is allowed at the, uh, the side road crossing and other things remaining the same. Now, unfortunately, I would say I will use that word. Unfortunately, this dumbbell, so-called dumbbell Word has been used on recently completed expressway that is called Eastern Peripheral Expressway around Delhi, where the shape, of course, it is called dumbbell interchange, but I don't think it's a dumbbell interchange. The shape used is like this, as you can see it here. Now, the problem with this is that first of all, the <clears throat> it has multiple movement and the same uh, turning. Then, first of all, it requires three bridges at location. Here the bridge, here the bridge, and here the bridge. Whereas in that case, the bridge location was only at one place. Secondly, as you can see it here itself with the layout, a very careful planning and extensive planning for signs parking is required so that there is no confusion of any first time user, especially in the so I do not know on what consideration this dumbbell interchange has been adopted, but I would never recommend any, anything, any shape like that. Then this is your trumpet interchange, where trumpet interchange is uh, provided normally when there is a T intersection. So side road is meeting at the T intersection. So this is your main road and this is your side road. So you can see it here. In this case, the right turning has been converted into left turning and then taken to the right. So that is how the configuration is. Double end trumpet, same thing. Then comes your clover leaf interchange. Clover leaf interchange, again, same principle. The right turnings have been converted into the left turning first. So uh, any uh, vehicle coming from here, if, if it has to take a right turn, it will go like this, come onto this loop, and then, sorry, and take a right turn. Similarly, for this, uh, want you to turn to right, it will come like this, take right, and then turn. Similarly, here also, like this. So that is how the right turnings have been converted into the left turning and then going to the right and left left turning of course like this if it's a us then you can very well imagine the other way around uh, the vehicle will be uh, this is we this will be the this direction of travel this carriageway and then you can see the right uh, left turning and then. so this is a, a full clover leaf there could be a partial clover leaf And then <clears throat> let us talk about some basics of the terminology. Direct ramp. Direct ramp is that 
this coming directly. Then your loop ramp. So loop ramp is where you have taken loop. Semi-directional, some part loop and some part direct. So this is your semi-direct. So these are the three basic terms which are normally used for the uh, leaf separation interchanges. Now this is your multi-level interchange where as you can see it here, there is absolutely, it may have two, two uh, levels or three levels, but all the movements are taking place at a different level. So is, as you saw it here, say for example here, weaving is, is necessary because say for example, vehicle movement like this, vehicle movement like this, then this is your weaving length and then taking off. So this becomes very important and critical length for safety point of view. You have to properly sign, etc. etc. But in this case, all the turnings are taking place at the same basic level. So you don't need to bother about it. This is your multi-level. This is the highest form and safest form and most efficient one. Now IRC is 92-2017, it is for the guideline for design of uh, interchanges as SP41 for the air grade, but mind you, this is for the urban situation. Uh, some of the basics may remain same, but one should always be keeping in mind that this, is, this guidance is available for urban roads. So if it's a rural situation or expressway, then the parameters are to be suitably taken. Unfortunately, right now, we do not have any uh, such any guidelines available in India for the rural roads. So if some of you who are really interested, they can take guidance from what is called the Green Book or uh, there is a publication like Indian Roads Congress. USA has a association uh, of, uh, of uh, this American Association of State and Highways and Transportation Officers, OSHTO, which has a very useful document called uh, Policy on Design, Geometric Design of Streets, streets which is terminology which is normally called is a green book. So that guidance can be taken from that book. So IRC 92 2017 is some idea of the land requirement of different types of grade interchange. Sorry? Is, is someone saying something? Sir, by mistake. Achha, okay. So, <clears throat> this is some idea. Uh, this uh, trumpet requires 44, and diamond requires 28,000. 73 one. So as you can see it here, the least land re requirement of the land is for the diamond interchange. So for Indian situation, I would strongly recommend the adoption of a diamond interchange. And I can tell you that uh, in US, even in US also, diamond interchange is a quite popular one, unless there are some other, uh, as I told you, interchange between an express and an expressway. So. For Indian situation where we have less uh, and less of expressways, right now diamond interchange should be, it is cheaper, less run requirement, and much simpler to operate and provide for. <clears throat> Again, IRC SP92 and the uh, expressway give some guidance from uh, the speed, design speed for the ramps, for system interchange and service interchange. Uh, as you can see it here, the direct one speeds are somewhat higher, as you can very well imagine, but for loop, speed are somewhat lower. And depending upon service interchange, it will, because it's a side road, so the speed still gets somewhat lower. So these are some of the guidance available on the this range of uh, expressway speed, and then speeds on the loop and um, direct interchange oh, uh, loop. Oh, 
ओके सो एंड अदर वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट ऑफ चेंजेस स्पेशली ऑन एक्सप्रेस वे इज ए डिटेल्ड सिस्टम ऑफ साइंस एंड मार्केटिंग now since we are going to discuss science and marketing separately also i will simply say that be we very very if you have any occasion to come across any design for express way you should be very very particular about the science and markings which have been provided on the design and irc sp99 2013 provides the details about the signages on express way type of provided i will discuss in some more detail and other document uh, useful for the science and markings are irc 67 2012 for the traffic signs and irc 35 2015 for the pavement marking now the other crucial part of the safety on roads is the signs and marking unfortunately uh, we play very little or rather no attention on this important aspect these are the basic tools you see all of you are a road user so from a road good road you want a few things only firstly my mind you are able you should be able to ride smoothly on on the road that means a smooth riding surface or less of rough secondly you should be able to reach from your origin to destination without asking anyone for the direction so what how it can be done by providing providing you proper signs for the guidance and also signs for caution you also of any possible hazardous situation which might so that is what the importance of the traffic signs and marking now <clears throat> just to tell you the background there is a there was a, a convention on traffic signs and signals in i nineteen which where a lot of uh, countries had participated and uh, india is one of them a lot of things were there but there were two three important points which i'd like to emphasize upon you one was that the traffic signs would use only graphics or symbol and no word for the simple reason that is supposing you write something in hindi and there is someone who does not understand hindi he will not be able to comprehend and understand the sign similarly if you are from the northern part of the country and if you go to the southern part of the country and they write some sign in the in their own language you will not be able to so if there is a graphic it becomes a universal language second thing was that for cautionary sign especially <clears throat> the countries were asked to adopt one of the two shapes either triangle or this uh, diamond shape so india adopted triangle shape so all the cautionary sign in india should be of diamond shape sometimes some of the even shipping manufacturers and some of the they are using diamond shapes for some of the signs which are absolutely wrong and one should never try to do that so these are some of the basics that one should keep in mind now coming back to the traffic signs and ir67 i am sure many uh, many or uh, not of many all of you must be road user and the driver also and you must know the basics of the traffic signs so there are three shapes uh, and three types of sign one is the regulatory and the other is the cautionary and third is the informatory or guide sign so regulatory or probatory signs are circular in shape except for few signs like a stop etc and the shape cautionary signs are triangular in shape and uh, informatory or guide signs are rectangular in shape ir67 gives the guidelines from the uh, for the placement of the signs uh, on the curb mounted the signs could be curb mounted or they could be on a gantry mounted 
Now, one should always keep it in mind that gantry mounted signs are full and, and they should be provided only when we say multi lane highway and high speed road, and you expect driver to make decision in a sort of a split second, etc. So, on a two lane road, these tie these uh, we have very uh, we are we have become very much enamored of provision of the gantry signs and they are sheer waste of money to my mind especially when you have tree um, obstructing the view also what is written on, the, on those signs so always keep it in mind over signs only multi lane highway high speed complex interchange restricted visibility closely spaced interchanges gantry or cantilever this is the history normally on a two lane road there is no point in providing the uh, gantry signs or overhead signs now color again is a very important aspect of the sign as you can see it here for <clears throat> regulatory signs or public uh, regulatory and mandatory signs circular shape with the uh, there are two, three schemes. One is, uh, as we can see it uh, later on, uh, basic is white background, red border, and then black signals, etc. Except for uh, compulsory uh, regulatory signs, which are blue background and white regions. Cautionary sign, white background, triangle shape, white background, red border, and black symbol. Except for work zone signs, which the white background has been now uh, changed to the yellow background only for work zone. Otherwise, uh, same. Then, <clears throat> uh, informatory signs. So, informatory signs uh, could be one the guide sign, the other could be uh, facility information. So, for guide signs, the expressway uh, color configuration is the blue background and white color. National State Highway and MDRs, the green with white, and Village Road or Rural Road is your white with black, and Urban Road are blue with white. So, Urban Road and Expressway have same color scheme, SH, NH, and uh, MDR have same color scheme, and Rural Road have a different color scheme. <clears throat> Some of the important points to be kept in mind is that these signs should be of a retroflective sheeting with the metropolitan grades grade 9 or or i think uh, train or whatever is given in r67 now unfortunately i do not know the why if there is a standard data book and many of the state governments uh, schedule of rate also provides a terminology of semi reflective signs which is technically correct uh, incorrect Highly correct and absolutely absurd. There is nothing like semi reflective signs. And I have seen in some of the states the so called semi reflective signs. They are neither here or not there. And more importantly, life on rural roads or people in using rural roads, their life is as important as people using national highway. So even on rural roads, only retroflective sheeting signs should be provided. Another thing is, there could be four size depending upon the speed and category. So for ruler road, a size of 60 centimeter is good enough. For normally on national highway, it should be 90 centimeter. And but for expressway for high speed, it should be 1.2 meters or or 120 centimeters. Size and and writing should depend upon the speed. Support should always be on GI pipe or rectangular one. No angle iron. Market no angle iron because it is highly dangerous for the sharp edges. Another important point is that there should be no words or or or, or either in any language. But if you are bent upon writing something, the IRC seven provides for a definition plate below the sign, as you can see in this photograph. If you want to say speed breaker. Provide it on a on a definition plate at the bottom of this of the uh, sign uh, shape of rectangle and say speed breaker. You can also write one meter ahead, uh, hundred meter ahead, or whatever. It, no, sorry, not one meter ahead, 
100 meter range, etc. etc. So, if you want to write anything on a sign, always do it on a definition plane, never on the sign itself. Or don't think that only providing this serves the purpose. So these are the signs uh, configurations, as you can see it here. The stop sign shape and configuration is different. Otherwise, it's a uh, and, and give way and a stop sign. These are different, but otherwise, the uh, mandatory or or guide sign, uh, uh, probatory signs or regulatory signs are circular in shape, red border, and black legend. So these are some of the uh, useful signs. Buses prohibited, car prohibited, etc. This could be useful for uh, pedestrianized uh, street. Then cart and bullock cart and kanga, hand cart. These are prohibited. These are prohibitory signs basically. Then these are prohibitory signs in terms of direction. No right turn, no overtaking, no U turn, one way traffic, no left turn, one way traffic, etc. These are some of the regular prohibitory signs. Then some of the typical signs, no standing. Many engineers make very common mistakes on provision of these signs. Now, one should always be, you see, no one in this world knows everything at all. Even I may not be knowing many things, but please, for God's sake, don't think that you are expert. Always try to uh, refer to uh, the standards available in India or elsewhere. Don't think that you are the expert in everything. No one is there. So these are signs for no standing. This is the sign for no stopping and standing, no parking, no parking on, on pavement, no parking on the this is this is part payment, this is full payment. This is no parking full. And and in this at the at the bottom definition plate, you can also provide timing also. No parking from this time to this time. These are again uh, proprietary signs uh, for a speed limit, for uh, loads, for axle loads, for height, for uh, load limit, for speed limit, as you can see it here, for width limit, etc. etc. These are compulsory direction control. So straight ahead, straight and left, straight and uh, sorry, straight and right, straight and left, compulsory right, compulsory left, compulsory uh, straight and left turn, compulsory keep left, compulsory speed of 50, compulsory cycle track, compulsory cycle track and, and pedestrian, compulsory pedestrian only. So these are some of the compulsory uh, direction control signs are blue background and white legends. Now, coming to the cautionary sign. As I told earlier, these are triangular in shape with red border, white background, and black legend. So as you can see it here, some of the commonly and useful. Left hand curve, right hand curve, right blend, series of curve, series of bends, <clears throat> side road ahead, side, side on right, on left, on Y, on the, 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 depending upon the direction. Y uh, intersection, crossroad, roundabout, signal, uh, T intersection, major road ahead, crossroad, left, right, uh, traffic merging from left traffic merging from right <clears throat> with narrowing width widening road width widening uh, narrow bridge steep ascent steep descent roads narrowing on the left side on the right side divided carriageway ahead divided carriageway ending uh, gap in median Pedestrian crossing. These these are the signs which commonly people do mistake. People means professional. One is the pedestrian crossing. The other is school ahead. This is the built-up area sign. 
then two way operation in this direction in this direction one lane closed one lane closed or, or the three lane, three lane highway one lane closed on the four lane highway uh, traffic directed to move on the other carriageway this again is sign which commonly uh, this this is the most what should i say cursed sign because normally it is never provided <coughs> or if at all provided wrongly provided either in shape most of the time it is found that there will be a small board place which is not even easily visible also and saying when it works which is very highly irregular and uh, against the practice so these are some of the newly introduced signs deaf persons likely to cross the road ahead blind persons this is for cycle crossing this is for cycle route ahead. This is for a speed breaker. This again is a wrong sign, uh, mostly uh, abuse sign, rumble strips, rough roads, dangerous splitting. Yeah, this is for barrier. This is for sudden uh, speed, tunnel, ferry, tram crossing, falling rocks. This is also very useful. These are the uh, hazard marker signs. This again is very commonly <coughs> wrongly used, especially these ones. Most of the time, these are placed in a reverse direction. We'll, I will show uh, maybe there is a slide uh, later on. These are the chevron signs which you can uh, place, you should place in the uh, when the road is taking a sharp curvature. This is a hazard marker when you allow the or rather guide the traffic or rather warn the traffic or caution the traffic that you, it can move on both direction of the obstruction. These are the sharp deviation signs, which I showed it on the hairpin bend. These are some of the signs uh, for guidance. These are your uh, stack type of advanced direction sign. These are flag type of advanced direction signs this is for the t and this is for straight and right this is for roundabout graphic sign this is for flag type direction sign this is your stack type destination sign or reassurance signs now normally the international practice and good practice is that the nearest destination is at the top and the farthest one is at the bottom but uh, anyway this IF67 provides for like this but I would as a good professional recommend that the nearest one should be at the top and this and this uh, mechanism this or rather this configuration has been provided in IRC SP99 for the expressway these are facility information signs hospitals public telephone, eating places, uh, uh, toilet, fuel stations, subway, foot over bridge. This is for subway, this is for foot over bridge, this is for resting place. These are for the expressways. Uh, this is for the start, this is for ending. These are the contraflow bus lane. These are for the tunnels signs. These are for the, say for example, parking for different categories of vehicles, for differently abled access, for a route marker, for state highway, national highway, Asian highway and expressway signs. Now these are some of the typical configuration or placement of the signs for an expressway for a cloverleaf interchange. As you can see it here, the first sign is a, uh, a two kilometer ahead of the first uh, at, uh, exit, and then at one kilometer ahead of the first exit, then 50, uh, 500 meter, 
and then at the exit you exit also you numbered it <clears throat> the first exit you call a the second exit you call b and exit numbering is also as a system unfortunately ircsp 99 does not provide a system of numbering of exit but the guidance can be taken from a very good document of usa that is manual for uniform traffic control devices that gives a very useful guidance on this so these are some of the typical computations of the sign to be provided on a clover leaf interchange uh, uh, on express way and uh, detailed guidance can be taken from the document ircsp 99 some of the yeah mina hello mina yes sir yes sir this session is up to what time 1 o'clock sir so oh, okay acha okay, okay right so now some of the basics of the signs in the work zone so in work zone sign uh, some signs have been added in terms of configuration and color scheme etc so uh, some signs are uh, normally as per ir67 some are additional like uh, work zone regulatory signs additionals are uh, <coughs> red and white and uh, then warning additionals are <coughs> yellow and black and similarly informatory also yellow and black so what these these are and the guidance can be taken from irc sp65 2014 as you can see it here <clears throat> these are additional work zone regulatory signs these are the warning signs uh, normal warning signs uh, which are uh, only the difference is uh, rest remaining same the only difference is white background has been changed to the yellow background these are the additional warning signs with the new color scheme and configuration as you can see it here another type of signs are variable message signs as you can see it on this which whereby you can change the sign that you want to give as i told you earlier even the speed you can keep on changing or say for example there is accident ahead somewhere so you can say accident slow down or one particular lane is closed or or take the right carriage way so these are some of the signs sometimes in odd uh, times you can give some uh, messages uh, relating to road safety but i would not uh, recommend that very what you call a strict manner but yes uh, on some time this practice is there now another important tool as i told earlier is the tape and marking so they basically provide a psychological barrier and help you in driving safely along the road especially in the night time so that is why the the quality of the material that you use normally the irc 35 is the proper document to be referred to so they provide for <clears throat> and ministry specification also thermoplastic paint with glass because that is quite visible in night time now retrospective sheeting and thermoplastic for signs and thermoplastic paint with glass beads in the night they are being adopted mainly because they are quite useful and visible very clearly during night time so now they coming to the importance of the marking as you can see it in this slide on the left hand side you if you there is no pavement marking and you have to cross the road you get a you see the safety or the danger are also of two types <clears throat> one is the actual danger and the other is the perceived danger perceived danger is like just like that that you don't want to go in the dark uh, uh, isolated place why just because of the, some perceived danger it may not be real danger but you perceive it that way similarly if there is no pavement marking and if you have to cross the road 
you get a perceived danger as if you are crossing a tunnel or a deep ditch and if the payment marking is there then you feel so comfortable so that's the importance of the payment marking, especially for the first time user in the night so irc 35 2015 there are different color schemes which are prescribed normally it is white yellow are some of the restrictive measures blue to indicate bus lanes <clears throat> green to distinguish bicycle and non-motorized transport red where you want to warn or hazardous locations but mind you be very careful about the color also and and always refer to irc 35 without think, thinking that you are expert and you know everything so the classification of markings longitudinal transfer hazard block arrow directional and facility marking longitudinal parking as you can see it here lane marking then the double line marking in the middle so that that means indicate that you don't have to cross if there is a marking uh, with a, sh a dash on the on on the, the the left side then that means you can cross only when it is safe to if it is on the and uh, sorry depending upon the left or right so you can cross from there depend if you if it's safe to cross The <clears throat> then longitudinal marking is also the edge line marking which is provided uh, between the edge of the main carriageway and the shoulders now international safe practices that you provide raised profile edge marking now irc 35 also provides for it that is that you have these as you can see it here these are somewhat ribbed at a spacing of 50 centimeters now the advantage of this rib these ribs are that the moment any vehicle crosses or deviates either due to fatigue or driver has falling asleep or dozing off and it goes like this then whenever the uh, vehicle comes onto this there is a rumbling sound as well as the vibration on the vehicle so the <clears throat> driver is warned that he is deviating from the main path of the travel so that is the advantage of this type of marking now if you want to be really safe then you decide that raised profile edge marking you also provide shoulder rumble which is comp quite common practice in us these are providing by the milling machine so unfortunately in india we are yet to have that milling machine so what can be done is that you can provide these with the uh, thermoplastic paint as uh, many of the locations you are finding in urban situation now And then very important thing, which is again uh, commonly done wrongly, is the provision of diagonal marking and chevron marking. Please listen very, very carefully. If the direction of travel is, is in opposite direction on both sides of the physical barrier ahead, then you provide a diagonal marking like this. That one direction is this left side and one direction is right side so you provide a diagonal marking <clears throat> the logic of this is that you are wanting to tell the vehicle to keep away to keep away to keep away from this barrier so that is why this diagonal marking. now if the direction of travel on both sides is the same then you provide these chevron markings again telling keep away So mind you, if you are going in this direction, so for, for both direction, the, the marking would be like this. But if the, if the travel direction is like this, then both direction, the marking would be similar. Like this. And other side also. I hope you have understood this point. These are pedestrian markings, pedestrian crossing markings. 50 width, uh, centimeter width and 50 centimeter spacing and three, three, three meter uh, length. Another very important point is the speed breaker or, or speed hump, which has been given in detail in IRC 99. 
but unfortunately uh, most of the field officers have this problem that whenever any accident takes place especially any fatality takes place local people put a lot of pressure on you <clears throat> to provide a speed breaker which is actually a breaker not a hump and local administration does not come to your rescue so my uh, suggestion to you would be that in the heat of the moment you can sort of accept whatever they are saying but gradually and gradually try to convince the local people the dangerous part and hazardous part of that ill conceived or ill constructed uh, hump and then change it and modify it to the proper one another important point is that even if any speed hump or speed breaker is provided it should always be accompanied by a cautionary sign on both sides and properly marked and <coughs> uh, uh, delineated and uh, identified. As you can see it here, you provide compulsorily these cautionary signs, and then these are the markings uh, uh, must be there. And it should be clearly visible uh, to the people who are approaching traffic. Otherwise, it becomes quite dangerous. Again, what I would strongly suggest to you is that any physical obstruction in the path of the high speed road is risky and dangerous. So it should always be a visual uh, measure for speed reduction measures. And then IS certified provides for these rumbles in combination. Details you can have, see it from IRC certified. These are signs for the stop. Normally, these are also uh, marked wrongly. This is the sign for the giveaway. As you can see it here, double line with a giveaway uh, marking here along with the giveaway sign. Now, this is the common mistake that normally is done. This is the correct way. So, if you are providing a hazard marker, this is how this should be that you want, you are wanting, you are telling the traffic to keep on this side. Similarly, here also, it's a two-way traffic, <clears throat> like this. If it's a some, some work area and you have to provide, then on the center of this, you provide something like this, as you can see it here in pictorial depiction. Now, this is, if the traffic is moving on both sides, this is the traffic is, if the traffic is moving in opposite sides. <clears throat> The other channelizing devices are traffic cones, tubular markers, delineators, median markers, plastic drums, object marker, explode struts. Now, these delineators are very useful, especially for the night time and in some of the special situations. I will show one photograph and one case study also. Now, another point which I want to emphasize upon nowadays. These plastic drums are <clears throat> normally and easily available in our country and they are not very expensive. So for God's sake, stop using your empty bitumen drums or any such thing with their, but because they are highly hazardous. Always use something which is softer. These are the how uh, payment markings effectively uh, provide you the delineation, especially during the night driving. Oh, this I have covered. Oh, there was a repetition there. Bus bay, then if there is a bus traffic, then you must provide for the bus bay. 3.5 meter minimum. And uh, then uh, sidewalk, pedestrian crossing also. Uh, <clears throat> IRC uh, 80, 1981 gives a, a reasonably good guideline of their location as well as the dimension. Now, these are some of the bus bays as you can see it here. This is Delhi and these are newly developed one, but there is no uh, transition bus bay uh, transition from acceleration to acceleration. Sudden, it's abruptly. So these are some of the common mistakes. I do not know why we are not able to pay attention on these. Things. This is, you see, this is, this photograph is taken from Singapore. And I can tell you, this is highly congested and very heavily trafficked urban road. 
but still they are able to provide these uh, proper well designed bus bay these are the markings which you must see here bus bays these are the truck levies these are the markings which i want to impress upon even if you cannot provide a physical uh, uh, separator the least that you can provide is the ghost island Tackling facilities, uh, which is quite relevant for the urban roads. Normally, it should be physically separated. This is the safest one. Wayside amenities are important uh, component of the safe travel, uh, especially for the long distance, and they must be planned and provided, especially on on uh, high facility and high category road like national highways and, and expressways. And normally the norms are that at, uh, after every 50 kilometers of driving, there should be a stoppage uh, or, a, or a place for a, a driver to stop and take a rest or take a, uh, use the toilet or, or, or refreshment or et cetera, et cetera. But the more important thing is that it should have proper deceleration and acceleration lane. And of course, parking facilities and various other facilities which are basically are mainly required for the rest areas. This uh, has already been shown. Highway lighting, <clears throat> more more so in in urban situation. There is a uh, guidance available of the lux level, which should be about thirty five to forty uh, candlas. Height should be six to ten meters, and spacing also three to five times of the height of the lamp. And there are very few things which I want to impress upon, especially for those, those of you who are working in this space. We have what is called the so-called intermediate lane. Now, intermediate lane is wrong, not only in English, but technically also. Why? Intermediate means, means not even one. So if we say intermediate lane, that means not even one lane. Whereas we are talking of one and a half lane. Now, lane widths, as many of you should be aware, is based on the maximum width of vehicle which has been allowed by Motor Vehicles Act or rules in India. So, based thereupon, the lane width of 3.5 meter has been prescribed. So, you have one lane for one vehicle. So, you have either one vehicle or two vehicles. You don't have one and a half vehicles. So that is why one and a half lane width does not make any sense. Some countries do have non-standard widths, but they are not for public road. These are purely for residential streets. That too only for allowing some space for uh, overtaking or other uh, yes uh, of any stalled vehicle not blocking the whole drive. But on public road like national highway or even on rural roads these type of lanes are totally dangerous. It would still be safer to treat them as a single lane with paved shoulder like this enhanced marking. So these are some of the very unsafe factors. Now these intermediate lane, uh, et cetera, et cetera, concept had come sometimes in 1973 when there was a, a acute shortage of bitmen and there was a problem of funding for roads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But now I think we cannot write back the history, but now whatever we are asking or talking of a new uh, development, it should always be minimum two lanes. I think all um, <clears throat> some of you who are, is there anyone from Uttarakhand? Mena? Yes, sir. Anyone from Uttarakhand? Yeah. Any participant from Uttarakhand may please respond. Sir, yes, sir. Achha, anyway. I am sure any of you must have heard the Chardam project. Now, Chardam project earlier it was thought of of uh, only 5.5 meter carriageway, but thankfully, <clears throat> Ministry of Defence rightly so, and Ministry also has now decided to provide minimum seven meter because you see these roads are uh, in a border area where the strategic consideration are equally important movement of the troops movement of the 
of the heavy vehicles of the army which may be required so 5.5 meter width of the carriageway for public road is totally absurd six laning besides other things the two major dangerous things in six laning document is raised median for a high speed road <coughs> it should never be raised median it should either be flush median or a depressed median even if you have a problem or retrofitting dismantle the existing uh, barrier curves and make it flush and provide a, a either a new jersey or uh, metal beam crash barrier for both direction as well another point which is dangerous for the six laning manual is provision of at grade pedestrian crossing when you are improving a road to six lane that means you are expecting high speeds and if you are expecting high speeds and if you provide at grade intersection for people to cross one can very well imagine the number of fatalities will keep on increasing now since uh, this is an online session not an offline session otherwise i would have asked you people that what can be done on this now this is a very typical situation especially on hill roads where you have a sharp bend now as you can very well visualize this bend becomes highly uh risky in terms of actual safety as well as perceived safety especially during the night time for a first time traveler so what can be done you can provide first of all edge lines delineators so that uh, the whole road is is visible in at time provide these chevron markings provide this sharp division sign at the apex of the turning provide uh, compulsory speed limit signs compulsory horn signs and compulsory no overtaking sign one more thing you should keep it in mind that no two signs should be placed on more than two signs should be placed on one support post as per irc 67 and the preference uh, or the priority is to be given to the regulatory or mandatory post so in this case even if it's a two lane road you can still provide marking like this as given in irc 35 to make it more safer and delineated now i think your detailed uh, program also includes something on traffic calming now i would like to emphasize upon you all that please for god's sake always keep it in mind that the term traffic calming has been defined it is started from europe uk and holland <clears throat> so it is basically for the residential streets it is not for the public roads so when we are talking of traffic calming it is for the residential streets and the idea is to sort of reduce the adverse impact of the traffic movement on the people living in the nearby or, or in the locality and there are certain uh, tools and mechanism for reduction of the speed one is the horizontal deflection uh, you provide chicane uh, chicane is a term whereby you somewhat narrow on the road by providing the physical uh, narrowing roundabout lateral shift <clears throat> you have a vertical deflection by provision of the speed table speed hump or raised intersection you restrict the width of the road by provision of the choker or median island or road diet then road restriction half closure median barrier diagonal bar diverter so these are there's the menu menu of options which are to be used for traffic coming so unless you have the option of using all or any of these then only you should have the use the term traffic coming so when you are talking of the public roads and you want to reduce the speed it will be more technically appropriate to use the word speed management so this thing you keep it in mind since this is not a 
detailed session on a traffic calming. I am not going much in detail, but it is just to make you aware that what the traffic calming word is. Now let me see what are the common mistakes that normally are done in our roads. As you can see it here, <clears throat> especially on hills and, uh, and roads which are, uh, are under the purview of the border roads, there is a very, I do not know for what reason, they are very fond of writing uh, uh, signs or slogans like this, which are totally sheer waste of money. Please, for God's sake, never use these type of signs. As you can see it here, these are signs with retroflective sheeting, like here. Now the sign, this triangle itself would have met the purpose better. There was no need of putting such a large uh, shape of the, uh, the sign. Similarly here, agar zindagi se pyaar hai to kam rakho. I mean, these are the signs, slogan signs, which make no sense. <clears throat> so the only thing that you are doing here is uh, by providing the sign is to help the uh, the contractor who has provided the signs and cheating oneself. You are not helping the user in any way. Here, <clears throat> now, if anything is written in four lines, and if you are driving at a speed of even at 60 km per hour, unless you stop your car, you will never be able to read all these one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six lines. You will never be able to read. Similarly, here also. So, for God's sake, please. Resist from installing such signs. <clears throat> These are again common mistakes of provision of the crash barriers in the middle of the uh, median, as uh, I told earlier also. These are sheer waste of money. <clears throat> and you can see it here. This is why I'm showing actual photograph. I could not find any habitation on both sides of the road. This is one side of the road, this is the other side of the road. As you can see it here. So I do not know for what purpose these uh, road over bridge has been provided here. This again is a sheer waste of money without any planning. And one more important part is that if you are providing any road over bridge or any subway for that matter, unless you provide a proper uh, sidewalk for pedestrians to come up to this point and then use, it will not be in the use. Now, <clears throat> just to give you an idea of uh, what developed countries are doing in terms of the facilities, is to show you this urban expressway in the city of Tang Santiago in, in Chile. As you can see it here in this figure, it's a three lane divided expressway, urban expressway, with <clears throat> five meter of central median provided with wire rope fencing for both direction of travel. Then <clears throat> crash barriers on the separator between service road and the main carriageway. And separator uh, or the frontage is again about five to seven meters wide. Then two lane of service road. Then again, minimum two to three meters of pedestrian walkway. Then again, two to three meters of building line, and then the building. And similarly on the both sides. So you can very well imagine the width of the road which is required at this particular location. And I can tell you and assure you that this is not a dot for second barren area. It's a totally highly commercialized area in the city. But if they have to build a expressway, it has to be built properly. Somehow, I do not know why. We get bogged down with the cost factor, with the land availability, etc. Et <clears throat> and always compromise on the standards. These are the list of some of the documents which could be useful for safe design of road. And some of them I will just read out. IRC 35, which is for the traffic sign marking, 46 on roadside, 52 for alignment and geometric design of hill roads, 53 accident form. Now this accident form has been further revised by the ministry in 2017. So I would suggest that you refer it uh, to the that circular of the ministry. 
then 67 for science, uh, 79 for delineators, uh, 80 for bus stop, 99 for traffic coming, 103 for pedestrian facilities, 119 for safety barriers with this correction which I told just now of the placement, 48 for hill road manual, 55 for work zone, 88 for road safety audit. <clears throat> now, coming to another important document. Sometimes in 1995, ministry had brought, brought out a very useful document, which I, of course, it has some mistakes, but still I feel type designs for intersections on national highways and MORT. Now, this is a very useful document. I hope it is available. If not, then I would request to all of you to suggest to IRC to get it reprinted. So, <clears throat> these, this is useful in the sense that without going into the actual detailed designing of the intersection, you get typical layout of different situation of intersection, which you can easily adopt in your work to design of the road. Okay, so this is what I had to tell you. I hope uh, you people uh, have got a fair idea of how uh, to design a safe road or what are the things which are to be kept in mind while designing a road which is safe. <clears throat> uh, now, I would very much like if any one of you has any, <clears throat> I have deliberately kept uh, about five, 10 minutes for your interaction. So any any point anyone want to make? I can see Mr. Dalvi. Have you anything to say? Yes, sir. Sir, yes. Uh, can you put some light on uh, safer geometry of roads? So what are the points to be considered for uh, safe roads so while uh, finalizing the plan and profile of new road? No, that there are certain basics. First of all, <clears throat> it will depend if it's a two lane single carriageway. Then, then I would tell you differently. If it's a divided carriageway, I will tell you somewhat differently. So, what is your single carriageway or divided carriageway? Single, single carriageway. Okay, single carriageway. So, first of all, comes the uh, horizontal alignment. Make sure that the curve there is a combination of uh, tangent length and curvature, and the radius should not be less than the ruling prescribed by IRC 73. Then there should be consistency of provision of the uh, radius. It's not, it should not keep on drastically changing. Say for example, at one place you provide 360, then the other place you suddenly provide 1000, then another place you again provide 150. So there should be a consistency. Because as you know, you are driver also. So if your alignment keeps on sudden changing, you get somewhat psychological as well as physical jerk in your driving. This is one point. Second thing is, <clears throat> I'm sure some of these points must have been covered uh, to you people uh, in earlier when uh, there was a uh, geometric design session with you. But anyway, from safety point of view, I'm telling you, this is one part that you should keep in mind. Then of course, the usual thing that the alignment may, you see, the main thing that you should keep it in mind is that the road should be self-explanatory, especially to that person who is using the road for the first time and in the night. No surprises. Then always pay attention to the intersection. Normally, we do not pay attention to the intersection. So pay attention to the intersection they should be properly designed depending upon their configuration. Then basic tools of science and marking should never be neglected. The road should never be taken as complete unless it has been provided with proper science marking and shoulder. And then of course the usual thing that the uh, horizontal and vertical element in terms of the peaking, et cetera, et cetera, should uh, uh, synergize, et cetera, et cetera. But this, I think these are some of the basics which you keep in mind that you, you, you are working as what? As an executive engineer, sir. Where? In PW Maharashtra. In PW Maharashtra, okay, right. 
so i hope this answers your point yes thank you sir yes sir if you have any uh, site related specific issue given everything that i very much i welcome it if you want to ask anything no that's all thank you okay okay what about any other point if if you do not have then i will i, I will have to find out from the list that i have mr ashish gupta mr ashish gupta is not present mr ashish gupta sir i have one, one query sir yeah sir you have shown that fix was road section in santiago sir just open that slide sir mera yes sir bolo just yes sent sir this is the good practice sir in this fix i observed sir there is no paved shoulder provided no no there is no paved shoulder provided on main carriageway sir in, on six lane divided highways way in I case of a red vehicle no then, uh, then. yes you have a point but basically since this is an urban express sir so on urban express way the exits <clears throat> would be quite frequent i presume but yes you have a point that should have been normally in uk practices that on express way especially they provide uh, refuge areas every 2 km okay. in us on freeways they provide uh, shoulder or or shyness as you you can on the medium side you will call it shyness on the far side you will cut the shoulder and that width is almost equal to one lane so this i will not say uh, your point is valid but i would since this is an urban expressway i think that uh, you can live with it yes is there any question from the participants what about parveen uh, chikara is he there ha huh? shruti nayak yes sir Hello? present sir do you have any any questions or any point to make you are you are serving in uh, maharashtra pwd maharashtra what level uh, a level acha a okay acha okay do you have any question uh, not now sir so the lecture was very nice informative no no that's a usual thing one can say yeah. acha okay acha okay 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 have okay, you sir. seen mumbai pune express way yes sir acha okay now if i ask you that what are the things which you find unsafe there so the, there are many a things actually because it is in uh, the major uh, portion is in ghat area so mm. some of the gradients uh, as per they are also very steep or uh, hairpin bends are present some of those mm. things are unsafe actually that's the only thing there are so many other things also i feel these are major things sir you do acha <laughs> okay tell me <clears throat> uh, What about the median? Is it a raised median or or plus or depressed median? Pardon, sir, I didn't get you. Median. Do you know the median? What is median? Yes, sir, I know. Acha, okay. So I just want to know that uh, Mumbai Pune Expressway does it have a raised median or flush median or a depressed median? In some parts, it is flush median within the hmm. plain terrain. But in hmm. hot areas, it is raised median. Acha, okay. And what is the width of the median? So somewhere uh, it is for five meters, uh, and uh, the hot section, its compromise section, uh, one point two meters to two meters median. Acha, okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, so you think it's okay? Uh, at present, it's okay. Lot of people are uh, comfortable with it. 
what do you mean by at present is okay so so, uh, so te technically it is not perfect uh, because they at some places it is compromised uh, with the irc provisions no but that's what i land restrictions land restrictions no, 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 one, 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 one moment one moment one moment i have asked you a question right yes sir so you answer to me as a professional not as a serving officer replying to your superiors okay do you get my point yes sir ah so okay now since you have not been able to say i will tell you yes sir Ex express way whether it's a ghat section or it's a uh, plain section or whatever it is there is median and is strict no no hmm now let me t i'll tell you one more thing first of all even in in uh, plain section also i think many places because i have traveled on this for, of course quite some time back it has raised medium and even on one particular location there was some sort of a control center in 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 the median itself am i right yes sir ah so these are highly dangerous things first of all on express way or for that matter any high speed road raised median is strict no no yes sir okay. now coming to your ghat portion do you think the life of people in traveling in ghat portion is less important than people traveling in the plain portion no sir everybody's life is important for that that so that means if you have uh, constraints of of land then what you should have done what they should have done was to provide new jersey barrier okay. if there was a restriction of the land available for the median in the stead of mm. providing a raised median acha okay. now does the trade raised median be provided with the crash barriers no sir oh yes yeah. all... yes sir yes yeah yes sir hey sir hi crash barrier hai yes sir but i i can assure you the crash barrier must be at some setback from the barrier curves of the raised median i i can assure you that <laughs> so this is one thing then of course i do not know whether you may be you we are aware or not uh, of course maybe you were not even born long time back sometime in 80s there was a very uh, uh, sort of uh, Known major accident where one film actress had died. Yes, And sir. The reason was, huh? Eh? Yes, sir. I'm aware. Are you aware of that? Yes, sir. Before What? the Barton Barton tunnel, it it is there is a tunnel Barton named Barton. Ah, yeah, yeah. Before that, the accident that happened. That actress was Bhavna Barve. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Ah, okay. You were born then? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, good. So, as I understand and as I remember, what had happened was that her car stuck against the electric pole and then mm. got overturned. Am I right? Hmm, I don't remember those details, okay, sir. But I remember it. Yes, that sir. was a classic case. And those electric poles were installed on the. normally they should have been installed at the back of the crash barrier because there should have been a crash barrier between electric pole and travel path but those electric poles were installed between crash barrier and the travel path okay sir so had those poles been installed at the back of the uh, crash barrier then we should have the, the vehicle would have uh, crashed against the crash barrier and then of course saved not only the vehicle but the occupant also okay sir do you, do you do you understand what i'm saying yes sir yes i got it yeah so these are some of the absurd and highly dangerous thing that we normally do either due to ignorance or of course of course ignorance i should say or in the false notion that we know everything that i know everything not we mm -hmm. okay yes sir what what else sir i have one more question 
हेलो सर सर आई हैव वन मोर क्वेरी सर 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 जनरली वी ऑब्जर्व सर क्रैश में ये डब्ल्यू बीम क्रैश वगैरह एम्बेडेड इन कंक्रीट सर हां मोस्ट ऑफ द लोकेशंस हां इज इट करेक्ट सर देयर इज नो हार्म बट इट शेड इट हैज टू बी लीन कंक्रीट I think I have some read somewhere, sir. That concrete WB crash barrier should be embedded in embankment. Uh, not, not very. Uh, Because if I you have also provide... checked this. No, no, Because I have it... checked this. Yes. This sir. this point was raised uh, earlier also by someone. But say, sir. for example, on hill roads, you have on valley side the retaining wall or 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 something like that. Yes, sir. and you need to provide so if it's a lean concrete i think that uh, some deflection would be available but if it's a proper reinforced one then of course not because sir uh, uh, somewhere in most of the locations are approaches of bridges uh, or uh, also are uh, uh, at that location also wbm crash barrier are provided most of the locations sir no you see normally uh, say for example if it's a prop uh, so normal embankment then it is to be provided with a proper drilling machine yes sir that uh, support post but if it, if you are having a, a lean concrete uh, basement then uh, you can provide the lean concrete there is no uh, sort of uh, arm in that it will provide you some deflection yes thank you sir any questions from I, no no but i expect more questions from the participants rather than from you Babul Biswas, is he there? Huh? He is not there. I think, uh, Mina. Sir. I think you have to be somewhat more strict uh, on online courses. Uh, sir, this is you... the sir. This is last online training program, sir. In next financial year, we are we are included only offline courses, sir. That's the same. <laughs> Because <laughs> I I. normally in online program what happens is that they show the jo joining they switch off the video and then they do their own things whatever they want to yes sir so i Excellent. i i doubt if most of possible. the participants are attending only due to atten for attendance sir yeah meena yes, is there yes sir no, no, not you <laughs> There is one participant M E E N A. Sulata Swain. Hello. Zahur Ahmed. I think they are all they disappeared. Anyway, what the time? Yes, sir. One nine. Okay, so I think if if uh, no one has any question, I should. Uh... Yes, sir. Sir, on behalf of all participants and IHC, sir, I would like to say thank you, sir, for sharing very informative lecture, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.